The way that accounting standards are often examined at SBR is in an holistic way, in an integrated way. In a case study where there's two or three different accounting standards all interacting. Now, we tend to study accounting standards in silos. So what I want to do in this podcast is to open your eyes to how certain accounting standards interact. My name is Tom Clendon and I am an online lecturer and I help students pass SBR by providing them with resources and providing courses as well. Now, in this edition of my podcast, I'm going to be talking about provisions and cash flow and deferred tax and fair value adjustments, at least. And in the beginning, I want to talk about provisions. And let's just recap. A provision is a liability of uncertain timing or amount that will only be recognised if, at the reporting date, there's been a past event which means there's a present obligation, either legal or constructive, which is going to result in a probable cash outflow that can be reliably measured. Now, of those three criteria, present obligation, legal or constructive, probable outflow, reliable measure, of those three, the most contentious is about whether or not it's a constructive obligation. Now, there, there will be a constructive obligation. Uh, it's like a serious promise. There will be a constructive obligation if there's been um, a valid expectation created that the company will pay the money out, even though technically, legally, it doesn't have to do so. Let's have an example. If prior to the reporting date, a public announcement is made to the stock exchange, to the trade unions, that there are going to be redundancies next year in specific places, specific numbers are mentioned. By making that statement, that's the past event which creates the valid expectation that the people are going to be made redundant, there's going to be a cash outflow, and therefore that creates the valid expectation and hence constructive obligation. Good. We understand provisions. Cash flow. Provisions are not a cash flow, which is why they are in the cash flow. <laughs> Hang on a minute. I need to explain. When we make a provision, when we make a provision for that redundancy cost, we'll charge it against profit in this particular case. So we recognise a provision by debiting the P&L, an expense, profit goes down, and crediting a provision, recognising a liability, liability goes up. That's the double entry. You're creating an expense and you're creating a liability. Now, that is not a cash flow. But the cash flow statement itself starts with a reconciliation of profit to cash. The cash flow statement starts with something which isn't about showing cash flows, but demonstrating that profit doesn't equal cash. And the recognition of a provision, an increase in a provision, reduces the profit, but there is no cash outflow, which is why we add it back in that indirect reconciliation. We're adding it back. So although a provision is not a cash flow, it does appear in the cash flow because it has reduced the profit without reducing the cash. Fantastic. Deferred tax. Now, deferred tax is all about temporary differences. Temporary differences between the carrying value of an asset or liability and its corresponding tax base. And certainly, if you're recognising a provision, you're recognising the carrying value of a liability, and now we have to think about its tax base. 
let me tell you that when you recognize a provision, the profit goes down. We've made the redundancy provision. We debited profit. Profit has gone down. But you're not going to get a deductible. You're not going to get tax relief. And I suppose this explains partly why the profit before tax is not our accounting profit. The profit before tax is not the same as the profits chargeable for corporation tax purposes. Because our accounting profit is reduced by the provision, the expense, but the profits chargeable for corporation tax purposes, the tax man is a hard person. They don't give tax relief on a subjective non-cash expense. They're ignoring it. So the tax base is nil. From a deferred taxation point of view, we've got the carrying value of a liability. We've got a nil tax base. It's going to be deductible in the future. We've got a deductible temporary difference. We've accelerated the payment of tax. We've got a deferred tax asset. So provisions interplay with cash flow. Provisions interplay with deferred tax and provisions potentially into play in group accounts and fair value adjustments. But let me recap. If I'm a company, if there is a company which is being sued for 10 million, but the lawyer says to us, there's only a 40% chance that we will have to pay out, it doesn't meet the threshold of an individual company recognising a liability under ISA 37 because it's not probable. You recognise a provision if it's probable. And if there's only a 40% chance of paying it out, it doesn't meet the recognition criteria. No provision is recognised. This is an example of a contingent liability. This will be a note to the accounts. There will be no liability recognised under ISA 37 at the individual company stage, and that is the perfectly correct accounting treatment. But if I'm a parent and I'm buying that sub, I look at the assets and liabilities of the subsidiary through a different prism, through a different standard. I want to know what the fair value of the identifiable assets and liabilities are. Now, they've got a liability of zero in respect of this contingent liability. They haven't recognised anything. But I know it's there and I can arrive at a fair value for it. Fair value is exit value. So it's normally what we receive when we sell an asset. But it's also what we could pay to get rid of a liability. And if you've got a 40% chance of paying out 10 million, you could assign that obligation for a payment of 4 million. At least that would be a good guesstimate. That would be a good judgment as to what the fair value of the contingent liability was. So we would be recognising that as a consolidation adjustment. A new liability of 4 million would come onto the balance sheet. In your pre-populated spreadsheet, plus four in your liabilities in your group accounts, if it hadn't been accounted for. Now, because you've recognised the liability at the date of acquisition, you've reduced your net assets. So the goodwills become bigger. So you're adding 4 million onto the goodwill figure as a result of the consolidation adjustment of recognising the contingent liability at fair value. Oh my goodness me. We've ended up talking about question one and pre-populated spreadsheets. Group accounts, love it. SBR, love it. If I can help you pass SBR, get in touch. Please like the podcast. Please subscribe. Please keep the faith. I love LinkedIn. I love WhatsApp. Yeah, my name's Tom Clendon. Thank you so much for listening.